Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Let's Talk Genealogy with your host, Desi L. Campbell. Tonight's show, we will feature four African-American slave narratives from Harnett County, North Carolina. Isaac Johnson, Nellie Smith, Charity McAllister, and James Turner McLean. This is a special edition of Let's Talk Genealogy, where tonight we will be on for one hour. We have some very exciting guests for tonight's episode, so we hope you sit back and relax and enjoy the celebration as we commemorate Juneteenth. Now we ask everyone to please stand with us as we sing the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing by James Weldon Johnson.
Our first slave narrative is Nellie Smith, narrated by Dawn Wright. My name is Nellie Smith. I was born on a plantation in Harnett County in 1856, where Lyndon now stands. I belong to old man Jack Williams. His wife was dead when I was born. There were many acres in the plantation. It was a large one. I don't know exactly how many acres. There were about 50 slaves on the place. The slave houses was on a hill. Master lived in the big house. It was a big one too. I don't remember ever going hungry when I was a slave. Father was the butler and mother was the housewoman and we get plenty to eat. My mother was named Rosetta Williams and father was named Atlas Williams. I don't remember my grandmother and grandfather, but I remember my great grandmother. We had a good home, good homemade clothes, and good beds. Jack Williams was good to his slaves. He was good to me and my mother and father. I heard him say that he was always good to him. Our living with him was good and we loved him. He thought a lot of his niggas. He had six children of his own, four boys and two girls. The boys, Dr. Jack Williams, Dr. Jim Williams, William Williams, and Jim Williams. The girls, Mary and Martha. I did little work in slavery time. Sometimes I fan the flies off the table at a meal times and did other light work. The male children do very little work in slavery time. We children play bass and had the switch. I saw a jail for slaves in Fayetteville, North Carolina, but I never saw a slave sold. I saw an overseer whoop a man once, but he certainly didn't hurt him much. He done more talking than whooping. We went to the white folks church, but not allowed any books for us. No one taught us to read and write. My father ran away once because he not taking a whipping. When he came back, they didn't do uh, anything to him. Didn't do anything to him. Jack Williams would not allow any patroller to whoop a nigga on his land. If they could get on his land, they were safe. He had overseers at the plantation. I remember one whose name was Buck Buchanan. When we got sick, Dr. Jack Williams looked after us. When Master Williams, Jim Williams, got to be a doctor, he looked after us. 
Yes, I remember the Yankees. They went to our house on Sunday morning. They did not fight on our side of the river. They fought on the other side of the river near the Smith house. It was a battle. The Smith house was a hospital. They came into the house. My sister, Irene, was high school. Yankees put their pistols to her head and said, you better tell me where the things are hid. Tell me where the money and the silver is hid at. Sister did not tell. Boss had started out with the silver early that morning. The Yankees caught him, took it, and his boots, horse, and all he had. He came back home barefooted. They got more, most everything. A lot of things belonging to the slaves. I heard of oh, the Ku Klux Klan. Ha <laughs> Yes, I have. I heard tell of they beating up people. But I never got into a tangle with them. I just don't know about all them old folks, Lincoln, Davis, Booker, Washington. I think slavery was bad because they sold families apart. Fathers from their wives and children and mothers away from their children. Two of my sisters was fixed up. Be sold when the war ended. The slave narrative of Isaac Johnson, narrated by Leslie Corpany. I'm feeling very well this morning. While I don't feel like I used to, I done so much hard work. I'm about all in. They didn't have all these newfangled things to do, work and go about on when I was a boy. No, no, you just had to get it out and do all the work, most all the work by hand. I was 10 years old when the Yankees come through. I was born February 12, 1855. I belonged to Jack Johnson. My missus name was Nancy. My father was Butch Matthews. He belonged to old man Drew Matthews, a slave owner. My mother was named Tilla Johnson. She belonged to Jack Johnson, my master. The plantation was near Lillington on the north side of the Cape Fear River and ran down to near the Lillington Crossroads one mile from the river. I had one brother and six sisters. My brother was named Phil and my sisters named Mary, Caroline, Francis, and I don't remember the others, their names right now. It's been so long since I saw any of them. They all dead. Yes, sir. They all dead now. I don't remember my grandpa or my grandma. No, sir. I don't. I was too small to work. They had me to do little things like feeding the chickens and minding the table sometimes. But I was too small to work. They didn't let children work much in them days till they were 13 or 14 years old. I had plenty to eat, good clothes, a nice place to sleep, and a good time. Master loved his slaves, and other white folks said he loved a nigger more than he did white folks. 
Our food was fixed up fine. It was fixed by a regular cook who didn't do anything but cook. He had gardens, uh, plenty of meat, plenty, and more biscuit than a lot of white folks had. I can remember the biscuit. I never hunted any, but I went bird blinding and set bird traps. I caught lots of birds. Jack Johnson, my master, never had no children of his own. He had a boy with him by the name of Stephen, a nephew of his from one of his brothers. Master Jack had three brothers, Willis, Billy, and Matthew. I don't remember any of his sisters. There was about 4,000 acres in the plantation and about 25 slaves. Marshall would not have an overseer. No, sir. The slaves worked very much as they pleased. He whooped a slave now and then, but not much. I have seen him whoop him. He had some unruly niggers. Some of them were part Indian and mean. They all loved him, though. I never saw a slave sold. He kept his slaves together. He didn't want to get rid of any of them. We went to do white folks church at Neal's Creek, a missionary Baptist church. We played during the Christmas holidays and we got about two weeks, four for July and lay by time, which was about the fourth. We had great times at corn shuckings, log rollings, and cotton pickings. We had dances. Master loved his slave, lots of freedom. My mother used to say he was better than other folks. Yeah, she said her master was better than other folks. The white folks didn't teach us to read and write. I cannot read and write, but The white folks only about half or less than half could read and write then. There were a few poor white folks who could read and write. I remember the baptisms at Derubin Matthews Mill Pond. Sometimes after a big meeting they would baptize 24 at one time. No slaves run away from Martha. They didn't have any excuse to do so because whites and colored fared alike at monsters. We played bass, cat, roly hole, and a kind of baseball called Round Town. Dr. John McNeil looked after us when we were sick. We used a lot of herbs and things, drank sassafras tea and mullein tea. We also used sheep tea for measles. You knows that. You know how it was made. Called sheep pill tea. It sure would cure the measles. About all that would cure the measles then. They were bad then. It was then. They is now. I saw Willis Cowery. They come through ahead of the Yankees. I saw colored people in the Yankee uniforms. They wore blue and had brass buttons on them. The Yankees and Willis Calvary took everything they wanted. Meat, chickens, and stock. We stayed on with Marspa after the war. I've never lived out of the state. We lived in the same place until Master and Mrs. died. Then we lived with their relations right on here. I'm now on a place their heirs own. Old Master loved his tram, and he gave it to all his slaves. It sold for ten cents a quart. He made brandy by the barrel and at holidays 
all drank together and had a good time. I never saw any of them drunk. People weren't mean when they were drunk then. It was so plentiful, nobody notices it much. Master would tell the children about raw head and bloody bones and other things to scare us. He would call us to the barn to get apples and run and hide and we would have a time finding him. He gave the one who found him an apple. Sometimes he didn't give the others no apple. I married Ellen Johnson, May 22nd, 1865, the year the war went up, and my wife is living, as you see, and able to be about. I'm not able to work, not able to go out anywhere by myself. I know I can't last much longer, but I'm thankful to the Lord for sparing me this long. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, as the nation approached its third year of the bloody Civil War. The proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforth shall be free. The Emancipation Proclamation narrated by Eric Brandon. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do, on this first day of January, in the year of our Lord 1863, and in accordance with my purpose, so to do publicly proclaimed for the first period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Plaquemines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, Lafourche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomack, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued and by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act sincerely believed to be an act of justice 
warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of marking mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this first day of January in the year of our Lord 1863 and of the independence of the United States of America the 87th by the President Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. Now coming to you is Miss Alicia Searles. She performed at the second annual Harnett County African American Heritage Festival in February. She's a member of the McLean's Chapel Free Will Baptist Church in Bun Level, North Carolina, where Bishop Sutton is her pastor. Your hand holding me And how would I live without you if I can't see Lord, what will I do in life? Where would I go? How would I handle things for all that I know? Cause I fall again. I fall, I fall so sure. You know, you know my end. From the start, you know my heart, I need you, I need you. Where would I go without your hand holding me? And how would I live without you? I can't see. Lord, what will I do in life? Where would I go? And how would I handle things? All that I know. Cause I fell again. I fall. I fall so sure. You know. You know my end From the start You know my heart I need you I need you When I call You hear me When I call Lord, you hear me. Your hand is there to hold me. I need you. When I call, you hear me. When I call your name, Lord, you will hear me. Your hand is there. To hold me, I need you, I need you, Lord. I need you, I fell again. I fall, I fall so sure. You know, you know my end from the start. You know my heart, I need you, I need you. Now joining us on this evening is Pastor Gary Murray of the Perpetual Praise Fellowship Church of God in Spring Lake, North Carolina. Hello, my name is Pastor Gary Murray. I was asked to take a moment to reflect and encourage the radio audience as we celebrate Juneteenth. 
Juneteenth is, of course, a day set aside to celebrate and commemorate the freedom of the slaves. That took place on June 19, 1865, where slaves were declared free under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation. So as I reflect on the celebration, I can't help but to consider the injustice that the African Americans continue to deal with even up to this present moment. However, through it all, I can say that God is still good. And while it was a wonderful thing for the slave to be set free, there is yet a freedom that I encourage all of my brothers to pursue, be he black or white. That is a freedom as only Christ can give. For John 8.36 tells us, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. For this is a freedom to love our brothers and sisters regardless of color. It is a freedom that I believe will no doubt make this world a better place. So as we celebrate Juneteenth, 2020, I say to all of my brothers and sisters, black, white, and of every other ethnicity, in this hour, let us choose to love and let's be free as only Christ can make us. I say again to you, happy Juneteenth and God bless you. The slave narrative of Julia McAllister, narrated by Shirley Marks Whitmore. Oh, huh? oh. my name is Chad McAllister. I was here a long time before the Yankees come here. I was about grown when they come through. I ain't all able to cook my little something to eat. Now I ain't able to work out. No, sir, not able to work. Done and work my time out. See, I was a grown gal when the Yankees come through. I was about 18 years old. Now I love to give you the truth. So I knows I was that old. I, I was a grown gal. My father was named Robert Blaylock. He belonged to the Blaylocks of Harnett County. My mother was Annie McAllister, and she belonged to Jeanette McAllister in Harnett County. I belonged to John Green at Lillington in Harnett County. See, my mother first belonged to John Green, but she got in the family way by a white man, and John Green sold it to a speculator named Bill Avery O'Reilly. Speculator. They sold my brother. He was white as you is. Oh, when the surrender came, mother went back. Mother went back to Miss Jeanette McAllison, Hornet County. See, that's how they got back there. Now, I wants to tell you the truth, and that's what I'm going to do. I tell you, I was whooped during slavery time. They whooped us with horse half whoops. They put a stick under our legs and tied our hands to the stick, and we couldn't do nothing but turn and twist. They'd sure work on your back end. Every time you turn, they'd hit it. Now, I've been whooped that way and scarred up. We, um, we slept on mattress made out of toe sacks. Our clothes was pole, one piece dress made of carpet stuff part of the time. One pair of shoes a year after Christmas. They give them to us on January the 1st. Now, no shoes till after Christmas. They didn't give us any holidays except Christmas in Hornet County. That was against the rules. No prayer, no nothing on the plantation in our house. They, they didn't allow us to go to the white folks' church. 
They didn't allow us slaves to hunt so we didn't have any game. And they didn't allow us any patches. Oh no, sir, we, we ain't had no money. Now the slaves slept a lot on pallets during slavery. Pallet was a quilt or a toe carpet spread on the floor. We used a cotton pillow sometime. There's about 50 slaves on the plantation. We ain't had no overseer on Masters Plantation and, and no books or schools or, or any kind for niggas. I can't read all right. No, sir. I wish you could read and write. Well, I split rails and worked in the Cape Fair River low ground. We fenced the field with rails split from trees, from pine trees. They was 11 foot long. 11 foot long. Oh, yes, sir. I, I see the paddle rollers. I see the, uh, plenty of them scoundrels. No. Oh, the Ku Klux. Oh, they was real scandals. And I just can't tell you all the mean things they done right after the war. Reuben Matthews, slave George Matthews, he killed two Ku Klux. They gonna double teamed him and shot him. And he cut him with the axe. And they did. I was mad right after the war. The second year after the war, I married Richard Rogers, but I kept the name of McAllister right on. My husband, yeah, he'd been dead a good long time, Lord. I, I don't know how long. I, I've been married one time, and that was one time too much. I have two sons, one named Clance and one named John, two daughters, one in Newport News and one in Washington, D.C., one named Levy, Lovey, Lord, Lovey, and one named Lula. The slave narration of James Turner McLean, narrated by Roy Harris. My name is James Turner McLean. I was born in Harnett County near the Cape Fear River in the Bush Creek section on February 20th, 1858. I belonged to Taylor Hugh McLean, and he never was married. The plantation was between Bowish Creek and the Cape Fear River. The edge of it was about 75 yards from where I lived. The place where I lived belonged to me. Way back in the day, it belonged to the Bowdens. The Bowdens came from Scotland, and so did the McLeans. There were about 500 acres in this plantation, and Marster Hugh McLean had about 50 slaves. The slaves lived in the quarters, and Marster lived in the big house, which was his home. Marster took good old care of us darkies. He did not allow anybody to whip them or whip us either. We had good food and clothes and a place to sleep. My father was Jim McLean and my mother name was Charlotta McLean. My grandmother name was Jane. I called my mother Sissy and called my grandmother Mama in slavery times. They did not have me to do any heavy work, just tending to the old cows, the coats, and going up to the old post office. The post office was at Mr. Sexton's, and we called it Sexton's Post Office on Raleigh and Fayetteville Road. The stage runs on this road and brought the mail to this place. The poet in my yard is part of the stagecoach axle. You see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what it is. I got it at Fayetteville when they were selling the old stagecoach. We bought the axle and the wheels and made a cart. That stuff about 1870, my father bought it. Yes, he did. Yes, him did. He gave $12 for just the wheels and the axle. This was after we had taken the iron clawed oath to become more civilized. We were daresome to be caught with a paperback book or anything. 
if we were trying to learn to read and write, we had to have a pass to go around or the patrollers would stop us. I saw a lot of patrollers. Marster gave his Negroes a pass for 12 months. He sent his timber to Wilmington and worked timber out of other places, so he gave his slaves yearly passes. Then when the war was up, about up, he went to the post office and he got the paper. All the niggers were free. We stopped on the way home at a large sacrifice tree by the side of the road where he always stopped to read. And he read and told us, Ice was free. Ice was free. I did not know what it was what it meant. We came onto the house where my mother was and I said, Sissy, we is free. Sissy, we is free. She said, Hush, or I will put the hickory on you. I then went to grandma. Then I called my mama and threw my arms around her neck and said, Mama, we's free. We's free. What does that mean? And mama, who was my grandma, said, You hush, hush, sick talk, or I will knock you down while I loose a stick. Marston was succumbing, and then he said in the paper his hand and was crying. He came in the door and called grandma and said, You is free, free as I am. But I want you to stay on. If you go off, you will perish. And I will stay now and crop. This work, we will divide. Master was crying and said, I do not own you any longer. He told her to get the horn and blew it. It was a ram's horn. She blew twice for the hands to come to the house. They were working in the river long about a mile or more away. She blew that long horn, then another one, and Marster told her to keep blowing. After Axwell were all slaves come home, she called them all in. Marster met them at the gate and told them to put all the mules up, all the hoes and plows, and they were all free. He invited all of us to eat dinner he had five women cooking. He told them that he did not want them to leave, but if they were going, they must eat before they left. He said he wanted everybody to eat all they wanted. I remember that, yes, I do. We had ham, eggs, chicken, and other good things. We had that dinner. That dinner was good. Then after dinner, he spoke to all of us and said, you have nowhere to go, nothing to live on, but out on my other plantation and Bill used some shacks. He gave them homes and did not charge any rent. He brought nails and lumber for them, but he would not build the house. Some stayed with him for 15 years, some left. He gave the cows to milk. He said the children must not perish. Marcus was a mighty good man, a feeling man. He cried when some of our slaves finally left him. Mother and father stayed till they got to a place of their own. I waited on him as long as, as he lived. I loved him as well as I did my daddy. I drove for him and he kept me in his house with him. He taught me to be honest, to tell the truth and not steal anything. When freedom came, Marster gave us a place for school building and furnished nails and gave them lumber for the floors. He instructed them in the building and the windows. He was going to put his sister, Jack Jeanette McAllister, as the teacher. She had married Jim McAllister at the Bluff Church, right as the lower part of the Aviesboro Battleground, where some of the last fighting between North and South were done. But a man by the name of George Miller of Harnett County told him he knew a nigger who could teach the school. He employed the nigger, whose name was Isaac Brantley, to teach the school. He came from Anderson Creek in the lower part of Harnett County. We learned very little as the nigger read, 
and let us repeat it after him. He would hold the book and spell and let us repeat the word after him without letting us see in the book. He stayed there two months. Then a man by the name of Matthew Haywood, Matthew, son of Henderson Matthews, came. They were white folks, but went for Negroes. Haywood teach there. He got the children started and most of them learned to read and write. I saw the Yankees come through, also Willa Calvary. The Yankees took chickens and things and they gave us some things, but Willa Calvary gave us nothing. They took what they wanted and went on. Marster hid his horses and the things in the Picasson. When the Yankees came, Marster was hid. They rode up to my mother and asked her where he was. She said, I don't know. Then they asked her where was the silver, his money, and the brandy and wine. They got one demijohn full of brandy. They went into the house, tore up things, get his china pipe fixed for people to smoke at one time. You could turn a piece of shelf off of all the holes but one. Then one man wanted to smoke. They threw away his old beaver hat, but before they left, he got it and left it in the house. Willis Cavalry stumped things and broke up more things than the Yankees. Daddy, his master's money, a lot of it in the jam o defense. He covered it with the sand that he threw out of the ditch that ran along near the fence. The Yankees stopped and sat on the sand to eat their dinner and never found the money. I had never seen a slave sold, and none never ran away from Marster's plantation. When any of his men went to visit their wives, he let them ride the stock and gave them rations to carry. There was a jail for the slaves at Somerville. I saw it. I saw it. We went to the white folks' church at Neal's Creek. Mother used herbs to give us when we were sick. Dr. Turner, Dr. John Turner looked after us. We were bled every year in the spring and in the fall. He had a little lance. He corded your arm and popped it in and the blood would fly. He took nearly a quart of blood from Grandma. He bled according to the rise and age. We ought to think a lot. Old Abraham Lincoln and the other great men, such as Booker T. Washington, Lincoln set us free. Slavery was bad thing and unjust. As we conclude this final episode of season one of Let's Talk Genealogy, we want to remember those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice and have given their lives that we may be able to vote we may be able to live and breathe in these United States. Join us as we lift up this great song, Heal Our Land, written by Patrick Love and sung by Ken Garber. Help us to humble ourselves and pray. Turn from wicked ways and seek your face. Fix our broken parts. Mend our wounded hearts and heal and heal our land. Ooh, there's a mother who is mourning the gun down son. 
And there are brothers who have gone down even more. Help us to find the walk as one. Colored barriers undone and heal and heal our land. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Are screaming now, it is fair. If we would only look to you for every care, cause you care. There is sickness and disease, there's death and pain, uncertainty has filled our hearts this day, help us to never lose our faith. Give us rest in these trying days and heal and heal our land. Fix our broken parts, mend our wounded hearts. Our land. Oh.